Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, this month's webinar in our continuing series of content specifically tailored towards media and publishing organizations. Today, we're excited to have Roberta with us as a guest, and I'll introduce her in a minute. For those of you who are regulars, thanks for coming back. And for the new folks, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the content that we today and uh, we'll continue to participate in our monthly series. So again, my name is Brett Kierset. I'm Senior Vice President of Sales and Operations for Knowledge Marketing. And uh, I'm going to be the MC a little bit today before turning over the content to Roberta. Um, for those of you who uh, want to ask questions along the way, please feel free to do, do so through the GoToMeeting uh, question box, and we'll try to get to them. And uh, I do record this as well, so a lot of folks take this and pass it on to other members of their organization for the recording, and uh, you'll get that information in follow-up. So again, thanks for coming today. Our focus is on mining your subscriber base for fun and profit. And so this is a, we're very lucky to have Roberta, who's a great customer here, to help us, and uh, we'll get ourselves started right now. So for those of you who are new to knowledge marketing, uh, we are a software and service provider to publishers and media companies. So we focus on a couple of different technologies, some of which Roberta is going to talk a little bit about today, but the main focus is on business results. But we provide a unified audience database. We provide an email platform, both for editorial content as well as for uh, marketing-related materials. We do circulation fulfillment, so that traditional service of helping you distribute and manage your magazines, your digital products, uh, your audits, et cetera, and really have grown our business over the years as an alternative to traditional circulation platforms. Uh, if you look at some of the customers on the screen, again, by being focused in this area, we really try and emphasize products and services for you, uh, and we're lucky to have folks like Roberta to come and share their stories uh, with you uh, for these type of, of sessions. So UAD, a lot of the topic that Roberta is going to get into, we used that acronym before. It's something that organizations in this industry are striving to create as an asset, just so we don't get caught in vernacular. UAD, Unified Audience Database, is a single consolidated view of your data across all the various different attributes, including email, circulation, web forms, et cetera. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and the desire of a lot of organizations, and it's really the main focus of emphasis today. So before, as background, before I turn it over here, last slide before I get to Roberta, as backdrop, um, like many organizations, uh, at a certain point in time, they undertake uh, a, an assessment of the way they look at from their content and their channels. And this is the slides from a presentation that we had done with Roberta in 2013. So when this project started, um, really laying out where they were as a business, uh, visual representation of the great brands across multiple different verticals that they have. And the resolution of this is uh, really the framework for what Roberta is going to cover today. So you know, we, she's been at this for quite some time. She's an incredibly knowledgeable person. Uh, she's got a lot of really interesting and clever ideas to share with you. Uh, today. So without further ado, it's all yours, Roberta. Great. Thank you. And it's nice to be here. Welcome, everyone. So Brett painted a very nice but siloed picture of our database a few years back. And you know, it had various types of data into very neat buckets and circles. But you know, to be really honest with you, it really wasn't that rosy of a picture, right? Our data looked a little bit more like this a little bit on the scary side, right? We had SQL databases of information. We had temporary tables. We had Excel files everywhere. We had um, webinar uh, information at vendors. We had information in our CRM of Salesforce. So it was a little bit all over the place. And when we wanted information and we needed information, we always ended up calling a guy that looked kind of like this. Um, when we wanted to take a deep dive and the salespeople wanted to um, come up with an ad hoc query, we, we had to call our database administrator. It was really the only way for us to get any kind of accurate information out of the database. And if you're like me, right, database administrators, they cost a lot of money. So uh, it's kind of not the type of thing you want them to focus all of their times on. So. We needed, a, we needed another alternative plan because by the time he put together files for us when we went back and forth, we ended up looking a little like this. And you know what? Quite frankly, that's not a good look for me. So <laughs> over time, sorry, 
I have to have humor in everything I do, right? So um, over time, what we wanted to do was really sit down and look at our challenges. You know, um, we had technical challenges of fragmented data and duplicated records, right? Um, time-consuming ways for us to get at our data. And we also had operational challenges, right? You know, it's, it's always difficult getting uh, your organization on board to start to think about looking at your data in a very different way, right? That's a little bit, sometimes it's a little bit challenging for you to do when you've always been doing something the same way. So let's take a couple minutes and just look at, you know, what what a real record look, looked like at North Star beforehand, right? So, you know, this is a real life example of what most companies had and what we, what we have that shows, you know, very specific pieces of information for the same person across multiple independent disconnected data sources, right? So if we look at me as an example, you know, I'm a duplicate record in a database that uses email as a primary address, as a primary key. You know, there are times, quite frankly, when I use my business email address and I use my Gmail account. There are times when I sign up for a webinar or an event, so I'm sitting on one Excel file. I might, I might have had my, um, my title changed, right? Or I might have gotten married and my na married name might be different. And at the same time, I might be in a different Excel spreadsheet looking completely different. Different interests, different subscriber products, uh, different locations, different social media channels, right? Different, different events that you, tend, that you attend. Our goal was to have a master consensus record, not just myself in a database with a bunch of different email addresses, right? To us, a master consensus, consensus record was integrating all that data, bringing it into a single source and kind of normalizing it so that I'm rolled up, right? I, I want my individual records to come in and be stored, but I want a roll-up of who I am. I want a roll-up of, of all my fields, of all my attributes, and I want to start to score that kind of data so I can see, you know, am I as an individual a really active record, which, you know, brings my lead score up. So kind of in summary, we were looking at taking a consensus across all of our databases and bringing them all together. So our vision and our goal was really, you know, we wanted to quantify our information, right? It's really hard. To, you can't quantify your information when it's kind of scattered all over the place. We, we really wanted to know how big is our audience? How, how big is our audience in each vertical market that we serve, right? How large is it? What's the composition of that data? How clean is that information? How, you know, we wanted to really put some more value behind that data. And then once you got all that data in there, right, you want to start looking at behavior. You want to start looking at, you know, are people interested in the, in the topics that we're putting out there? I mean, it's easy to go to your website analytics and say, okay, yes, people clicked on a bunch of newsletters or a bunch of articles about a certain topic, but who are those people? I want to look at those people and see, you know, I want to see them as a group, right? But more importantly, not just the vision and the goals, we wanted ideas. You know, we wanted to come up with new ideas that we can say, hey, you know what? We found a slice of data inside our database that really has some in interesting information about it that's going to enable us maybe to come up with a new product, um, offer our our audience a new ways to engage with content because we can see what it is that they're doing and really looking at increasing the profits, increasing the, if we increase the value of the data that we have in the database, by all means, we should be able to increase the overall profits, right, within the company. So that's really, ideas is what we really were looking for. So we moved on and we actually partnered with, with Knowledge Marketing and um, it's been a great partnership. And we created not only our consensus database, but we gave it a name, we gave it a face. And that database is North Star's Audience Insights. Um, we wanted to make sure we were a very forward-thinking company, right? We are, you know, we're thrilled to be able to know the number of benefits that we can get out of our audience database. It brings the overall value of our company up, really, significantly. Um, so we branded it, 
And we then took our database administrator, that poor man at the very beginning of our, of our slides, uh, and we focused him on um, more complicated projects, more technical projects that really, really needed a, a database administrator. So we really gained back the benefit of allowing uh, technical people to actually focus on technical tasks. So we've centralized our database. We gave it a name. We've got lots of different you know, slices and dices and, and dimensions of the data. Um, we've got uh, great new revenue possibilities. Uh, we've, we've also prevented email fatigue. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But I think what's important to note that is, you know, we wanted to make sure that when we, when we picked a solution and we, we, we embarked on this journey, that uh, the technology was really giving us a way to really create um, granular kind of complex queries, but by the layman, right, by the end user, right? We wanted them to be able to sit in front of a screen and I want this and this or that, right? Put together a complicated query. We also wanted the tool that we selected in the vendor, you know, we wanted to be able to see all the records in that filter, right? And we wanted to be able to combine them together so that we can start to really look at these Venn diagrams that were really important to us. And we wanted to be able to look at email activity, demographics, and subscriber information. So I think one of the best features in the tool right now that the team really seems to love is the, is the ability to, to have complexity managed by the business. You know, we, it works really well for events, right? When you're looking at events like, I want to look at the individuals that maybe attended a specific conference. All right, I got that pool of people. You know what? I want to overlay that with people who signed up for maybe the event a year ago or maybe a similar event or maybe event in a certain job description, a job market, market area, right? So I want to be able to overlay all those pieces of data because that helps the marketing team craft the appropriate message for the appropriate pool of people, right? It's no longer just guessing, hey, let's pull a bunch of people together and send them an email message and we think this is what it's going to say. Really, you really start to be able to craft the message that goes out to the individual. So we've been able to use these types of um, features inside the tool really a lot to help us um, find new people for new attendance for our events, right? So we've talked about the database. Let's talk a little bit about then some of the opportunities. You know, we've had a bunch of them, right? We've, we've been able to um, come together as a group and look at opportunities of, around the sales area, right? Profits, new products looking at, you know what, how do we develop and improve the data overall? How do we keep um, cleaning up and improving upon the audience development? You know, again, we talked about some new products. You know, let's look at old products. You know, sometimes you have products that, you know, they live on forever, right? And no one ever really takes a, you know, takes a minute to stop and actually look at old products to see if maybe they need to be shelved or Maybe there's something going on with that product that if we looked at the audience and the behavior, it would be able to, you know, give us some clues as to what we should do to improve it. You know, let's also talk about developing a community, right? Developing, looking at the audience information and the insights it provides us to see if we can start to build out communities within our audience, maybe honed in on a specific topic or a specific type of product that they might want, right? So let's now look at five different areas. And I tried to put together a, a couple examples. One of the things that we really leverage quite a lot with our sales opportunities is the power of looking at behavior. So it's, it's very easy for us to look at a pool of people and start to look at who's actually engaged, right? Because it's all about engagement right now. Let's look at people who've looked at, opened, clicked on specific types of emails that have gone out or specific newsletters that have been sent out. You know, let's take that one step further. I don't want to just look at types of 
um, emails, or I don't want to look at just opens, right? I want to look at people who very specifically clicked on very specific articles, right? Or maybe articles that had a specific topic in them. Or let's even pull in information from our website, right? Let's look at people who have engaged with data that may have in that query string might have a specific topic, um, a specific topic or a geographic location, right? So you really can use the tool we found to, you know, mix and match engagement to try and come up with marketing messages that we might need. Um, it's also a really great way to do the inverse, right? It's who's not looking at information? Who's not clicking on something? Who's not opening up something? And sometimes, you know what? Sometimes you really do as an organization need to take a step back and look at that as well, the inverse of who's just not engaging with your information. So we've been able to come up with a lot of different sales opportunities with our sales team just around this particular type of screen at all. And, and let me, let, before we move on, let me talk a little bit about, you know, sometimes just be prepared. It takes sales a little bit of time to get there, right? So when we built out our, our database, you know, we trained our sales team originally that it's all about quantity, not quality, right? It's like whoever can have the biggest email list, go, go, go. And that's, that's you know, that's what they learned. That's what they knew. So it took us a little bit of time to start to shift that mindset, to start to talk about targeting, really. You know, not only the value of targeting, but the price. It's premium price. You know, you can't sell a targeted list to a thousand people who are really honed in on a specific uh, specific topic, you can't sell that. You can't undervalue that anymore. So the, it was really helpful to bring up this type of activity filter screen with our sales team and really start to show them how granular, how granular we can actually get. And I think when you have the ability to, to show them on the fly information, that's when that light bulb starts to go off in their head and they start to they start to really get the value and they start to kind of join you on your mission to make audience database, right, your audience database a, a hot commodity and one that you can premium price. Let's talk a little bit now hey, about... Roberta. Oh, hey, Roberta, yes. sorry to interrupt. There was a question. Just, I'm going to, it kind of, you almost answered it. So let me just ask, I'll add to it by saying, when, when, it, when it comes to that pricing, you know, you talked a little bit about the salesperson side of the equation, but what about the customer, advertiser, sponsor, agency side of it? What, what's been the understanding and receptivity to paying a premium, you know, or their understanding of the premiumness, I guess, if you will, of behavioral data versus, you know, kind of selling small quantity over large? Yeah, that's a good question, and, um, and it's going to come up. And, we were afraid of that question before we even started the database project, right? We were actually like, what is that price going to be and how are our customers going to be re reacting because we've been selling them really large lists at, at X price. But we have found that the majority of our customers are receptive to it because they want to spend their money wisely and they want that targeted audience. You know. We understand the importance when you're just branding, and, and yes, you kind of want to meet the masses, but we do have a lot of clients that are coming to us looking for targeted, and now we can actually have that conversation, and the client knows the value. So um, I don't think we get as much resistance as we thought we might have when it comes to actually making that price a little bit higher. And it's kind of trial and error. Um, we asked a lot of questions to, to peers, the, our peers in the industry on, okay, so how are you pricing? You know, what did you start out with? But you know what? You have to know your market. You have to, you do have to kind of trust in the salespeople that they know, they know their clients. And it's, it's a little bit of give and take in the beginning when you start to come up with what that pricing should be. But once you've got that under your belt a little bit, then you really can run with it a lot more. I hope that answered the question. question. Yep, thank you. Great. Great. So another thing is developing audience, right? Um, we've been able to really use this tool to look at 
how successful our newsletters are and how successful is our mar are our marketing efforts. And whereas before we used to send out, let's just say newsletters to you know a very large pool of individuals, um, we've been able to actually start to look at reducing that churn, right? Taking a look at kind of resting people off the file because they're just not engaged or resting people because the behavior, you know, that behavior is just not there. And it's really been able to help us um, kind of push back and put at bay that sometimes that, that large opt-out that people worry about, right? You start, you know, taking out your club and beating people over the head with it over and over again. Every company, I don't care who they are, every company faces that that churn of list churn and that that turnover in audience and that that high opt out rate and it's it's so hard to get people on your file we we shouldn't be doing that anymore right so we really have been able to use the tool to our advantage to to nurture to grow and to protect the audience because at the end of the day that's our that's our bread and butter our audience is is our bread and butter. It's one of the most important things that we hear we have here at North Star. So using a tool with this kind of rolled up look at your audience is a great way to be able to um, you know nurture, like I said, and protect the data that you have on hand that you spend a lot of money and a lot of time trying to build up. Let's talk hey, a little bit. Yep. Well, there was one more, there's one more one more one kind of question a little bit on that last point. So it, it, you, you talk a little bit about past behavior about across multiple products. Can you just kind of give a little bit of like what does that mean? Like, like oh, just a little bit of detail of what that what one might, might look like. All right. So um, you've got newsletters, right? Everybody's got newsletters. Everybody's got marketing emails, right? So let's just take a particular type of newsletter that you're sending out. Um, sometimes over time the list starts to decrease or your engagement starts to increase, decrease. And we used to just chalk that up to, well, you know what, let's just assume, you know, we need better editorial content, right? Um, we would make a lot of assumptions about looking at an Excel spreadsheet that had newsletter information on it over a period of time, right? Now what we're able to do is really instead of just making some blanket assumptions, right, we're actually able to look at products and compare products together over the course of time, looking at not just the open rate, not just the click-through rate, but what are the topics that people are reading. You know, are, we can move around modules on our, on our newsletters now to say, okay, is it really true that the video of the day is getting a lot of click-throughs just because it's at the top of the list. Well, you know what? We could actually start to restructure a newsletter and then track and trend that and watch that over time to see, hey, you know what? People actually just, they do like it. It doesn't matter where we move it in the newsletter. And, and I know sometimes you could just go into your email tool and look at some of that information yourself, but when you can look at that information from the point of view of the audience, I, I just think it's a little bit more valuable. I hope that answered the question. Perfect. Great. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, new products. So we love Venn diagrams. We're like, you know, it's like the new crack here. Venn diagrams. So we've found that when we're able to overlay pieces of data, uh, pieces of um, audience and behavior together, it really enables us to visually see the anomalies, right? It, it allows us to kind of uncover like little hidden pockets of information that maybe we might not have noticed if we didn't create a, di a Venn diagram. Because sometimes when you're just looking at raw data, you can't kind of get to the same results, right? So we've been able to kind of come up with different types of diagrams depending on how it is we're querying data to really look at um, are people interested in information and does that information span maybe different brands, right? So we have 
meetings brands that serve the meetings market and we have brands that serve the retail travel market and we have brands that serve the the corporate travel market and procurement market and um, we found one time um, someone on our team was doing some uh, overlays and looking at some data and we found that there was kind of a, a correlation between some individuals in the corporate travel market and the meetings group and you know what, I don't know if that data would have been at our fingertips had it just all been sitting in an Excel spreadsheet, right? So sometimes we find that having a tool that enables you to kind of show cross-connects in the data actually gives you more insights into some relationships that we have amongst the brands that kind of, I don't want to say they're siloed because they're they're not, but they are kind of you know, they're marching to their own beat, right? Each, each brand is out there doing their own thing. But from an audience perspective, um, having a centralized audience team of people, which we do, they're the ones now that can go in and find anomalies in your data to say, hey, you know, this is, this is kind of interesting. I got a query from someone in, in this particular brand, and when I started to really look at the data based on demographics and not just the audience in that specific brand. When I looked across all in North Star, I started to see some correlations in groups that I wouldn't normally have thought of. So that's been another interesting area for us to be able to kind of try and do some brainstorming on, you know, maybe there's a new product there. You know, maybe there's some similarities that we can come up with, uh, you know, a new digital product or a new product that can be sold jointly by two different brands, right? So uh, it's been a really great vehicle for new product development when overlaying and cross-laying data. One question on that um, was about the content, like the new products. Are they usually, do they generate, um, is it usually repurposing old content or brand new content or is, or is it really, it depends? It depends. Um, you know, yes, repurposing existing content is great because it's, it's, it, gives a, it gives the editorial team a break, right? Because they're always busy and there's never enough editors to go around. But so repurposing is great. But it, it does also give you insights when you, come, when you can sit collaboratively, collaboratively across groups, um, brand A and brand B, and really start having some just open dialogue and discussion I found that sometimes the editorial team, they do come up with new ideas. And, and then it's just a question of finding the resource or the freelancer. And, you know, the, the idea spawns from there. So it could be both, introducing new content as well as maybe inserting tidbits of old content or maybe just freshening up some old content a bit. I think, the, yeah, and, and the, way, <clears throat> the way you said it before, or somebody said it was, <clears throat> you know, you used to create a product and then go find an audience. Now you find the audience and go create a product. You know, exactly. and I think, okay, perfect. So I'm giving you credit for that, even if it was Len that said it or somebody else. <laughs> Great. So, uh, all right, so let's talk about existing products. Um, you know, sometimes it's good to look at existing products. I talked a little bit about that before, Looking, looking at, um, looking at the data behind existing products and you know I tried to come up with one ex example for you uh, and this could be it could be any topic right it could, I, I've got boating on the screen right we don't even have a boating product but boating it could be skiing it could be family travel it could be for my friends out in Watt it could be chickens or pigs or cows doesn't matter what the topic is um, you know we can go out and say you know what let's let's target an audience right that's receiving a specific newsletter on a certain topic, right? Boating, pigs, cows, chickens. And you know what, now, now let's look at that target audience and let's bring in another filter, right? Now let's look at people who may have been clicking on links in this particular newsletter or other newsletters. I don't care what newsletter it is. I don't care what email it was. I want to find people who've been engaging with links that um, also had to do with boating, boat, boats, boating, boating, sailing, right? We can, we, can, we can query that the way we want to. And let's look at that filter. And you know what now? Let's go 
let's go look at our one of our websites and let's see who in the database is going and visiting our websites that's looking at pages, pages on the website that might have to do with the topics that we're talking about, boats or boating, ski, skiing, family travel. Um, let's see what that pool of people looks like. You know what? Let's take that one step further. Let's go look at another website. And these websites could be in the brand family or not, right? Let's go look at another website. And again, let's look at website B and look at that same query. Let's look at the pages that the audience is visiting that are related to boats or boating. And now let's take all those people, like Brett mentioned before, it's, you know, let's build the audience. Let's look at now cumulatively who are all these people based on different behavior and different products. And let's look at how many people do we have now that are kind of interested in this topic, right? And that's great. We can actually run that pool of people now and start to look at them as an audience, right? Rather than from the creating the product and looking back, right? So let's do the data comparisons. Let's look at the people interested in an existing product, but let's build off that existing product, right? Like, so we started the query with just, you know, one newsletter and a topic, but we were able to take that two, three, four steps down and be able to wrangle together more individuals who have common shared interests. And then when we look at those people, we look at the volume of those people, you know what? Maybe there's enough of them to have, uh, to have a small event. Maybe there's enough of these individuals to have a lunch and learn on that topic or a road show. Maybe there's enough of these individuals to carve out a, a new newsletter that's, you know, boating tip of the day, right? So it, it doesn't matter what the topic is, but it's taking that concept of looking at one product and using the tool to our advantage now to spread that same kind of like-mindedness out to kind of reach a larger audience. And then from there, Again, brainstorming and thinking about what can we do with this audience that has similar interests and obviously a, an affection for a certain topic, right? So that's the way of looking at kind of an existing product and kind of making that, taking that stepped approach. Awesome. All right, so next up we have, you know, kind of, Kind of looking at this holistically as, you know, developing and managing like communities of audience, right? So how can we use the data to find maybe a niche audience or a pool of people with a common interest, right? So we did it, we did it before, right, uh, on the previous screen looking at an existing audience. But here's, a, here's another little slice of looking at behaviors, right? So let's look at individuals who happen to like to plan meetings on the East Coast, right? Let, let's, let's pull together all the states on the East Coast. You know what? Let's take that a step further. And let's start to look at people who live in the radius of, you know, of, of New York City. And you know what? Let's take that a step further. Let's start now to target people who also are looking for a certain facility type or maybe people who are looking for or purchase golf in the past, right? Golf's a huge, golf's a huge thing for us, golf. Um, you know what? Let's take that another step further. I mean, golf's a sport. Hey, let's start looking at people who've ever, who've clicked on any links in any newsletters that happen to do with sports, golf, baseball, football, tennis, you name it, put it in there. You know, let's really start to kind of grow that target audience based on their behavior and let's see what comes out of that. Let's even take that a step further and again, it's like the same thing that we talked about on some of the other slides, it's let's now look at website behavior and let's look at audience who've looked at websites, who've, who've viewed pages or read articles or looked at videos or looked at a slideshow or looked at a facility or a hotel related to any one of those sports that we've been talking about. This now be able, it, it gives us a way to kind of create 
a, a new community of, of, of targeted individuals within our database who have a whole commonality over, over sports, the whole, entire sports industry, meeting planning and focus on sports, right? So again, this helps us tremendously when we're looking at events. It helps to give us new ideas over product offerings. And again, it also helps us go back to our audience who's looking to us for content and, and engage with them. Hey, you know what? We see that you're really interested in these types of topics. You know what? We're going to bring, we're going to give you some more of that because we know you're interested in it, right? So again, it's being able to take the time to mine the data based on all the different things we've been talking about today to really focus on new products, new revenue streams, and even looking from an audience perspective, giving your audience more of what it is that they're actually interested in. So that's a little bit about, you know, kind of managing communities. So from a publisher's perspective, you know, how has this whole journey kind of panned out for us? And, you know, I think we've really earned a lot of credibility in the industry. You know, um, we've we stepped out of the gate well before many of our, our competitors with this very, very powerful, centralized, unified audience database. And again, that, that ability to look at me, Roberta, as an individual and all my intricate data, all my little data fields, right, and not look at me as an email address, to me, that, that's, that's really powerful. So we've been able to, like, earn a lot, I think, of credibility and a lot of trust with our clients because we've got access now to very high-quality information, and we have insights around it. And we're able to, you know, it's not just like talking to your clients about why it's important, but it also... It also makes your clients think about, wow, we should have something like that ourselves, right? I mean, sometimes your clients' databases are just a disaster. And you could start to think about, well, you know what? If I could do this for my own company, I could certainly do it for you too, right? So the, the, the possibilities become kind of endless there. Um, so we are, you know, we're authoritative. We've, we've got contextual data. We've got, you know, relevant content married with, no, oh, you can flip back there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm on the. I'm getting to premium pricing in the in the in the long way. Um, we've got relevant content married up with behavior and demographics, and you know what? The bottom line is that all equals cold hard cash. That's premium pricing, and that's what your your executive team wants. That's what the sales team needs. That's what keeps fueling your business: premium pricing, and the batch and blast concept. And and you know we still say it too. You know it's an email blast, but you know, we really had to kind of educate first our sales team to kind of throw away that, that terminology of just bass, blast and batch, right? Batch and blast, say that 10 times. You know, really had to kind of train the salespeople first and then from there really explain to our, our, our own clients, again, that's not really what you want to spend your money on, right? You really want to spend your money on high quality, high quality. That's really what we're pushing. So it's really enabled us to work with our clients to kind of create a communications blueprint that's really centered around targeted audiences. And then, again, sales ROI. Um, you do need a really well-trained sales team. It's, it's really critical, and it does take time. I'll kid you not on that. It takes time, but you know, once that sales team gravitates and understands it and gets that, that, that light bulb goes off, on their, goes off in their head, then you really could start to see the ROI behind that. And I have to tell you, too, sometimes it shows you that you might need to start to look at a new, uh, a new talent pool. You might need to start to bring in new people to work in the organization that really understand the value of high quality. And sometimes that's an eye-opening thing for us too as a, as, a, as a company. So kind of wrapping things up a little bit, it's like, you know, what are the possibilities out there? Well, we've kind of touched on all of them today. We talked about custom, custom products. We, we, talk, we could talk about custom ads, right? Now that we can 
craft an individual message to a targeted audience, we can start to think about you know very custom ad sales around that program, right? To to web visitors based on targeting ads to to web visitors based on demographics, past interaction with content, right? Um, we could increase revenue name. You know, we, we're driving up our our cost per lead. We're um, putting more value and more revenue towards our, our overall list rental. You know, we can offer um, data hygiene services now. Uh, we can look at uh, append services, right? So we're, we're looking at our database a little bit di differently now to come up with a whole new revenue stream and really making the, the, the cost per name very, very valuable to ourselves. You know, we didn't talk a little bit about market research, but Sometimes you might find the golden nugget in your data that the light bulb goes off and you're like, hey, you know what? We can do a whole market research around this particular topic and then wrap a product around that. And, you know, let's sit down as a team and talk about, you know, what are the revenue possibilities behind that? Let's sit with the sales team and talk about that and see what what's the ROI around that kind of product. So you can actually even start to get into market research. And then, you know, the long-term, you know, silver lining really is predictive and al analytics and algorithms, right? It's being able to enhance the web experience and enhance the product or offerings to new visitors and really getting to the point where maybe you might be able to do some predictive analysis ahead of the game, right? And that's the golden nugget that we'd really like to get to. So that's that's next on our roadmap. So that's the first. Yep. That was awesome. There's a, I got a couple, I got another good question. Um, so it, it's a little bit on the market research. You were almost hinting at it. A little bit about, so, you know, you have your traditional customer base of who you've normally sold to. And, you know, are there any new potential clients beyond those traditional advertisers? I think maybe you mentioned market research. I know those are the product side of things, but have you found either new advertisers or new engagements that maybe you didn't expect before? You know, that's interesting that you say that. We were just talking about that yesterday in a, in a brainstorming meeting with one of the brands. And um, that's something that we're embarking on now, really looking at the data and seeing if we can tap into a whole new area of customers that weren't at our fingertips before. Um, that's next on our list to tackle. Uh, and I, I think we'll get there. OK, perfect. And then one last question. I know we're, we're kind of late on time, but one last question. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll add to Jeff's question. So a little bit when you, you know, when you're merging records together, you know, and I know you guys were one of our first customers to deal with the issue of what happens when someone has six emails, you know? Um, so I think the two parts to it, number one is just a little bit about the process on merging them together. And, you know, some of it is our technology, but some of it is just your own logic. And then the follow-up to that is when someone has multiple email addresses, how do you pick one? You know, if you're going to run a campaign or something, you know, have you ever cracked that, you know, decision process if you're going to do an email campaign? Yeah, that's a great question. We really struggled with that because, you know, everybody's like emails are valuable. We can't throw any of them away. But um, I will tell you this. We sat down and thought long and hard, sometimes to the point where our brains hurt, about what are all the business rules that we want to put in place when it comes to the algorithms to roll up that data. And it, it can get a little bit complicated, right? So sometimes we look at those files that come in, because remember, files are coming in at all different times. And we look at, you know what? Well, let's look at the most recent date that the file comes in at and say, hey, you know what? If this file's coming in and it's new, let's let's take that most recent email address and update, right? So it's gonna it could be different for every organization. So you know what we did at Northstar, you know, it's kind of working for us. Uh, it might not work for you, but as an organization, you do need to have that tough conversation. And I would just I would say to you, don't make it too complicated, right? So, um, you know, you can always turn around later and make changes. Um, it's, it's not always the easiest thing to do, but to me, nothing's ever totally etched in stone. But you need to look at 
the frequency that those files are coming in at, you need to look at, you know, how old was that data that you were starting with in the first place? You know, when you start to load up that database, that's another thing you need to think about is, okay, what are you going to load in first? You know, what's, the most, what's the most accurate data you're going to load in first? What are you going to load in second? And then when you start to think about that process and kind of map that out on a board, those answers will come to you and, and you'll make up those rules based on what, you know, wherever you want to draw the line in the sand. Well, and, and didn't you, didn't it, I remember the discussion, you know, if you ask two people, if you ask a salesperson, the same person with two email addresses, how many people is that? They used to say two, and yeah. now it's really one. I mean, and, and you have to reconcile with that as a business, and I know you guys spent a lot of time talking about that. Yeah, we, we did, and like I said, it, it, it's not, you know, everybody's answer might be a little bit differently on that, but, you know, Looking back now, you know, I'm glad we've put some of the rules in place to say, hey, you know what, if this is the logic, a certain email is going to win. Um, because at the end of the day, Roberta's Roberta. You know, I, 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 I'm one person. I, I'm, not, I'm not six. And it also starts to look at the cleanliness of your data as well, because quite frankly, I think six is a little excessive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How could I have six? <laughs> Well, good. Well, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for all the good questions. Um, we really appreciate it. Again, there's a recording of this. And, um, you know, again, we're really grateful for folks like Roberta. Next month, we've got another customer presenter, too. So I'm getting a break, which is nice. But we're going to continue to give you guys valuable content. So, Roberta, again, thank you so much. Appreciate everybody. And uh, if you're interested in the recording, we'll send you out a link to download it. And, uh, again, we'll see you guys all again next month. Take care, Roberta. Thanks so much. Great, bye.